livelihood not only for the rural and tribal people but also many of the uh, people who are residing in india now owing to this peculiar nature the indian planners have identified sericulture as the best suited occupation so mulberry sericulture has been traditional occupation in karnataka tamil nadu karnataka tamil nadu ap and kashmir uh, kashmir tasar one in mp chota nagpur division and orissa muga one that is tasar is tasar silk then you have muga silk in assam nagaland tripura and eri silk in assam and west bengal northeastern part of india is the only region in the world where all the four varieties of the silk are produced are produced now coming to the central and the state level government silk departments they are actively engaged in addressing the objective of promotion of the sericulture in the traditional as well as non traditional regions regions it is expected to gain about uh, to gain an accelerated tempo of sericultural activities in the country now sericulture has now become an agro based cottage industry involving independent interdependent rural semi urban as well as urban based activity, activities so participation of women is about 60% now now thus in contrast to other agro based profession the role of women in sericulture is also dominating which is helpful for improving the status of women in the family and uh, enterprises now coming to in the light of the women welfare through a sericulture industry the central silk board under the ministry of textiles has established a special component of assist assistance to women and also to the ngos into national sericulture product now uh, there are four major research centers for sericulture in india they are central sericulture research and training institute bahrampur which is located in orissa central sericulture research and training institute located at mysore central tasar research and training institute ranchi that is in jharkhand and central silk technological research institute that is in bangalore karnataka so the, now there are four major research centers for sericulture and lot of research has been done and it is still going on for the production of the silk now coming to sericulture what basically sericulture is what are the different components of sericulture so we all know commercial rearing of the silk producing silkworm is nothing but sericulture or in other words we can say the production of silkworm is called as the sericulture so it contains three components one is the cultivation of food plant of the worms because when you are culturing the worms you need to give them the food so cultivation of food plants is required second is you have to raise the silk worm you have to culture and then raise the silk worm then reeling and spinning of the silk so the first two actually are the agricultural so these are actually being carried out by the agricultural farmers and the last one that is the reeling and the spinning of the silk it is an industrial component which needs an industry so the industrial people or the industrial workers actually do the reeling and the spinning of the silk there are four major varieties of silk worms that are found in india they are classified into mulberry culture tasar culture moga culture and eri culture so any each one actually is described separately in this now coming to taxonomy so what is uh, what is this where actually this silk worm we all know actually silk is being produced by the silk moth so the silk moth belongs to which phylum which class so silk producing almost all the silk producing insect insects are commonly referred to as serigenous insects they are called as serigenous insects and the silk worm actually is a common name for the silk producing caterpillar larva of the silk moth so the silk moths belong to which phylum they belong to phylum arthropoda class insecta order lepidoptera super family bombycoidia then this bombycoidia comprises about eight families of which only the bombycidae and saturnidae are the two important families Uh, which actually comprises of the members that produce the natural silk there are several species of the silk worm that are used in commercial silk production so now so this is about the brief what we say the taxonomy of the silk moth so silk moth belongs to phylum arthropoda class insecta order lepidoptera superfamily bombycoidia and the family is the bombycidae as well as the saturnidae so they all actually because other families are also there but these two families actually produce the silk moth that produce a natural silk now coming to the several species of silk worm are there that are used in commercial silk production now basically there are five that is mulberry silk worm tasar silk worm moga silk worm and the eri silk worm now coming to the mulberry silk worm now what are the mulberry silk worm 
So they are Bombex mori, which is called Bombycidae. It belongs to family Bombycidae. Then you have Bomb Bombix mandarina, uh, which again belongs to family Bombycidae. Now, tessar silkworm actually is Antheria mylita. It belongs to Saturnidae. Then you have Antheria pernia. These are the different species, which again belongs to Saturnidae. Antheria yamame, then Antheria paphia, Antheria roeli. So these are the five different species of tessar silkworm, which all belong to Saturnidae family, whereas Bombyx mori and Bombyx mandarina belongs to Bombycidae. Then you have Muga silkworm. Now, Muga silkworm is Anthria asama, which again belongs to Saturnidae. Then you have Eri silkworm, that is Philosamia ricini, which again belongs to Saturnidae. So, Bombycidae, uh, Bombycoidia actually is a super family. This comprises of eight families, out of which only two are important, that is Bombycidae and Saturnidae, because most of the silkworms actually are under this particular, uh, uh, what do you say, family, and they produce the silk. Now, coming to the biology of this mulberry silkworm and how this particular silkworm is being cultured now we'll see. So the insect producing mulberry silk actually is, uh, is a domesticated variety of silkworm which has been exploited for about 4,000 years. So almost all the strains raised at present belong to this particular species that is Bombex mori. Uh, Bombex mori. Now that is believed, uh, that is derived from the original mandarina silkworm that is Bombex mandarina mori. Now, China, you all know, is the native place of the silkworm, but now it has been introduced in almost all the silk producing countries like Japan, India, Korea, Italy, France, as well as Russia. Now, the different races of this mulberry silkworm have been identified on the basis of geographical distribution as Japanese, Chinese, European, or Indian origin, or as uni, bi, or multi voltine, depending upon the number of generations. So you might know actually univoltine, bivoltine and multivoltine means now the silkworm actually undergoes the uh, generation that is when it undergoes the life cycle. So based on the number of generations produced in a year under natural conditions, they have been named as univoltine, bivoltine or multivoltine. So the races of this mulberry silkworm actually have been identified on the on not only on the basis of geographical distribution of Japanese, Chinese, European, but also as univoltine, bivoltine, or multivoltine, depending on the number of generations that it produces in a year. As uh, this tri tetra as pentamolters, according to the number of moles that occur during the larval growth or as pure strain. Now, coming to the life cycle, the li life cycle of this silkworm consists of, you all know, as four stages. Any insect, if you take, they undergo uh, four stages. That is, the life cycle of these insects comprises of four stages. They are adult egg, larva, and the pupa. Now, the duration of the life cycle is about six to eight weeks, depending upon the char racial characteristics as well as the climatic conditions. Multivoltan races, as you know, it is found in tropical areas. They have a shortest life cycle with the egg, larval, pupil, and adult stage lasting for about nine to 12 days, 20 to 24 days, then 10 to 12 days, and three to six days respectively. That means here what they're saying, Egg will last for 9 to 12 days, larval stage will be for 20 to 24 days, pupil for 10 to 12 days, and adult will be for 3 to 6 days. Now, 7 to 8 generations are produced in multivoltine races. Now, coming to univoltine, the egg period of this is last for 11 to 4 days, larval period 24 to 28 days, pupil period 12 to 15, and adult 6 to 10 days. In so, in nature, univoltine races produce only one generation during the spring, and the second generation of eggs goes through a period of rest or hibernation till the next spring. Now, in case of bivoltine, yeah, here, in case of bivoltine, uh, bi uh, bi the second generation X do not hibernate and they hatch within 11 to 12 days and produce second generation normally during summer and it is the third generation X which undergo hibernation and hatches in the next spring and thus producing two generations in a year. So this is about the life cycle of the mulberry silkworm. Now this is, see here, this is the eggs. They are actually, the eggs actually are being produced on the Mulberry, see this is a mulberry leaf where you have you are seeing the eggs. Then next is the larval stage. 
then you have the pupal stage then you have the adult male and female so you can identify the male and female depending upon their size so males are generally shorter or you can say smaller when compared to that of the female so this is a simple life cycle of the bombax mori so now coming to each stage now so as you all know egg egg is round and white so the weight of newly laid egg will be laid egg 2000 x is about 1 gram so it measures about 1 to 1.3 mm in length and 0.9 to 1.2 mm in width so with time the eggs will become darker and darker then the races producing white cocoon, uh, cocoons lay pale yellow eggs while races producing the yellow cocoons will uh, lay deep yellow eggs so in case of hibernating laid by vivoltine and oriolitine the egg color will change to dark brown or purple depending uh, of the um, so uh, with the deepening of the color of the serocell pigment so the eggs may be of diapause or non diapause type so the diapause type of eggs are laid by the silkworm in temperate region where the silkworms belong to subtropical regions they produce the non diapause type of eggs then next is the larval stage after 10 days of incubation the eggs will hatch, hatch into larva called as the caterpillar after hatching the caterpillar will need continuous supply of the food because they are voracious feeders so newly hatched caterpillar is about 0.3 cm and pale yellowish color the larval body the uh, body is densely covered with bristles and as the larva will grow it becomes smoother and lighter in color lighter in color due to rapid stretching of the cuticular skin during different instances of the stage then the larval body is composed of the head thorax as well as the abdomen then the head consists of six few segments it carries the appendages such as antennae mandibles maxillae and labium median epidermal suture clypeus and labrum are well developed six phase of larval eyes or ocelli are located then five segmented antenna are used as sensory organs mandibles are well developed powerful and they are used for mastication maxillary bob and palp um, lobe and palpi help in discriminating the taste of the food then you have prementum which is also chitinized that is consists of chitin and its distal part will carry a median process known as spinneret through which the silk is extended out from the silk gland so the sensory labial papilla are found on both the sides then the thorax has three segments that is prothorax then you have mesothorax and metathorax each of these thoracic segment carries one pair of true legs which are conical in shape and carry distal claws and these claws are used for crawling but also help in holding the leaves while feeding the abdomen consists of 11 segments only one uh, uh, though nine uh, segments though only nine can be distinguished the last three are fused together to form the ninth uh, ninth segment so third to sixth and the last abdominal segment bear a pair of abdominal legs which are fleshy and jointed and muscular eighth abdominal segment bears the caudal horn on the dorsal side then these abdominal segments only carry the sexual markings on the ventral side which are developed during the fourth and the fifth instars females the sexual marking appear as a pair of milky white spot on each of the eighth and ninth segment and they are called as ishivatas four gland and ishivata's hind gland respectively in males a small white milky white body known as herald's gland will appear ventrally now nine pairs of spiracles are present one pair of the first thoracic segment and eight pairs on each side and the larval growth is marked by four molting so it undergoes four moltings and five insta stages so the fully grown caterpillar now develops a pair of seri uh, sclerites or silk glands which are called as seri uh, seriteris or silk glands they are modified labial glands so you all know actually the, almost all the insects have got a labium so these silk glands are nothing but the modified labial glands so these glands are cylindrical and they, they are divided into three segments that is anterior middle and posterior segment so the silk glands are very very important because the silk is being produced or extracted from these silk glands so we don't need the silk moth completely but we need only the silk glands so the silk glands are the major producing silk so they are the modified labial glands so these silk glands are very very important so they, these are cylindrical and they, they are composed of three segments they are anterior middle and posterior inner lining cells are characterized by the presence of large and brown nucleus these glands secrete the silk which consists of an inner tough protein called as fibroid which is enclosed by water soluble gelatinous protein called as sericin so the protein that is present in this actually water soluble protein it produces two one is the inner tough protein which is fibroid and you have a water soluble gelatinous protein which is called as sericin 
So in Bombex, the fibrinogen, which on extrusion is denatured to fibroin, uh, and it is secreted in the posterior segment of the gland and form the core of the silk filament in the form of two very thin fibers, which are called as brins. Then this sericin, a hot water soluble protein, which is secreted by the middle segment of the gland, holds the brins together and covers them. The duct from another small gland called as the Loinitz gland that lubricates the tube through which the silk passes, joins the ducts of the silk glands. And finally, the silk is molded to a thread as it passes through the silk press or the spinneret. Now, next stage is the pupa. Now, pupa is the inactive stage. So, it is the inactive resting stage of the silkworm. It is a transitional period during which definite changes takes place and during this period, biological activity of the larval body and the internal organs, they, they undergo a complete change and they assume a new form of adult moth. So the mature silkworm passes through a very short transitory period of pre-pupa before becoming a pupa. They are during this, dissolution of the larval organs will take place followed by the formation of the adult organs. Soon after the pupation, the pupa is white and soft and gradually turns br brown to dark brown and the pupa skin becomes, becomes adult. Then simultaneously, a pair of compound eyes, large compound eyes, a pair of antennae, four limb, uh, wings, hind wings, and the legs are also visible. Ten segments can be seen on the ventral side, but only nine are visible on the dorsal side. Then seven pairs of spiracles are present in the abdomen, last being non-functional. Sex markings are prominent. That the female has a fine longitudinal line on the head, whereas such markings are absent in case of male. Then the pupa is covered by a thin oval, yellow silken case called as the cocoon. The pupal period lasts for about 8 to 14 days. The next is the adult. So the adult of Bombax Murray is about 2.5 centimeter and pale creamy white. After the emergence, the adult is incapable to fly because of its feeble wings. The, because the fins will be very fragile, they are free, uh, very uh, feeble uh, and they have a heavy body. So that is the reason why as soon as they become adult, they cannot fly. So it does not feed during this short period. So the body of the moth has general plan of insect body organization. The ocelli are absent and the antennae are conspicuous. They are large and bipectinate. The meso and metathorax bear of wings. The front pair overlap the hind pair. So the moth is unisexual and it will show sexual dimorphism. In male, eight abdominal segments are visible while in female only seven. The females are smaller, uh, has comparatively smaller antenna. Its body and the abdomen are stouter and larger and it is generally less active than male. Whereas the male poses a pair of hooks known as halves at its caudal end while the female has a knob-like projection. So just after emergence, male moth copy, uh, uh, copulate with the female for about two to three hours and die after that. The female will start laying eggs just after copulation, which is completed within 24 hours. And the female will lay egg, four to five hundred eggs. The eggs are laid in clusters and are covered with the latent secretion of the male moth. So like this, the cycle will go. So this is all about the life cycle where the silk moth, like any other insect, will undergo four stages. That is the X, larva, pupa, and the adult. Now coming to rearing of the mulberry silk. So when once these uh, silk moth are produced, how to actually go about with the culturing or, uh, or the cultivation So of this mulberry silk? So before going for the mulberry silk worm rearing, you need to actually give them the feed in the form of plants. So basically, this mulberry silkworm feed on the mulberry plant. So mulberry cultivation is very, very important. So this cultivation of this mulberry plant, you call it as a mori culture. You call it as mori culture. So there are about 20 species of this mulberry, of which only four of them are common. They are Morus alba, Morus indica, Morus serrata, and Morus latifolia. So mulberry is propagated either by seeds, root grass, or by stem cuttings. So the last one is the most common. So usually, they propagate this plant using the stem cuttings. So the cuttings about 20 to 23 centimeter long with three to four buds each and pencil thick are obtained from the mature stem. They are planted directly in the field or first in the nurseries to be transplanted later. After the plants have grown, pruning is carried out routinely which serves for two purposes. One is induction of the growth and sprouting of the new shoot. Then harvesting of the leaves is done for feeding the larvae. It is done in three ways, either by leaf picking branch cutting and top shoot harvesting. So in leaf picking, individual leaves are individual leaves are hand picked, uh, hand picked. In branch cutting method, entire branch with the leaves are cut and offered to the third instar larva. In top shoot harvesting, the tops of the shoots are clipped and given to the fourth and the fifth instar larva. So the yield and the quality of the larva again depends upon the 
practice for cultivation of mulberry trees namely uh, uh, trees namely irrigation application of fertilizers etc so the more you give them the water as well as use uh, the uh, uh, fertilizer that is applied fertilizers you will get it, uh, the yield will be more so it is estimated that about 20000 to 25000 kg of leaves can be harvested per hectare of land under optimum conditions it is also estimated that to rear one box of 20000 eggs about 60 to 65 kg of the leaves are required for spring uh, rearing and 500 to 550 kg for autumn rearing in japan so in india to rear 20000 eggs okay the quantity of leaves required is about 350 to 400 kg so this is all about the mulberry cultivation that is where you culture the mulberry leaves which is very very essential because the mulberry silkworm feeds only on the mulberry leaves now coming to the uh, rearing equipment now for rearing of the silkworm you need to have these equipments so what are those one is the rearing house then you require the rearing stand rearing house actually should meet certain specification as the silkworms are very sensitive to the weather conditions like humidity temperature so the rearing room or the rearing house should have proper ventilation temperature as well as the proper humidity so it should be ensured that dampness stagnation of air exposure to bright sunlight and strong wind should be avoided then you need to have a rearing stand rearing stands are made of wood or bamboos and they are portable these are nothing but they are the frames at which the rearing trays are kept so a rearing stand should be about 2.5 meter high 1.5 meter long and 1 meter wide and have 10 shelves with a space of 20 cm so they are arranged on the shelves and each stand can accommodate about 10 rearing trays then you should have an ant well ant wells are provided to stop ants from crawling onto the trays because when you are rearing the silkworm you should not allow the ants so if you keep the ant wells all the ants actually will um uh, get uh, enclosed in it so the ant wells are provided to stop the ants from crawling onto the trays as ants are serious menace to the silkworms so they are made of concrete or stone blocks about 20 cm square and 7.5 cm high then the legs of the rearing stands will should rest on the center of the well filled with water then rearing tray so these are made of bamboo or wood so that they are light and easy to handle so they are either round or rectangular the next is paraffin paper paraffin paper actually is a craft paper coated with paraffin wax with a melting point of 45 it is used for rearing early stages of the silkworm and prevent withering of the chopped leaves and also helps to maintain proper humidity then you should also have foam rubber strips the long foam rubber strips about 2.5 cm wide and 2.5 cm thick dipped in water are kept around the silkworm rearing bed during the first two insert to maintain optimum humidity newspaper strips may also be used then you should have chopsticks chopsticks are the tapering bamboo rods and they are meant for picking younger stages of larvae then feathers birds feathers are also used preferably white and large they are important items for silkworm these are used for brushing newly hatched worms to prevent the injuries then chopping board and knife the chopping board is made of soft wood it is used as a base for cutting leaves with knife to a suitable size required for feeding of worms then leaf chambers these are used for storing harvested leaves the side walls at the bottom of these are made of wooden strips the chamber is covered on all sides then cleaning net cleaning net are made of cotton or nylon leads of different mesh size to shut the uh, size variation of different instances of the silkworm and these are particularly used for cleaning the rearing beds uh, for cleaning the rearing beds the next is montages montages are used to support the silkworm for spinning cocoons they are again made of bamboo Uh, they are again made of bamboo they are also called as chandrikas so other types of montages such as centipede rope montage or straw uh, cocooning frames are also used then hygrometers or thermometers are also required to record the humidity as well as temperature then feeding stands are also required they are nothing but small wooden stands used for holding the trays during the uh, feeding as well as bed cleaning so the other equipments like feeding basins sprayer and the leaf baskets are also required so these are all about the uh, equipments that you require for rearing the mulberry silkworm so this rearing practices actually must be done with utmost care since they are susceptible to diseases so therefore to prevent the diseases and also good sanitation methods and hygienic rearing techniques must be followed so the appliances and the rearing room should be thoroughly clean and disinfected 
with formaldehyde solution. Room temperature also should be mounted, maintained around 25 degrees centigrade. So this is all about the rearing. Now, procurement of quality seeds. So when once you rear, rearing is done, how to get rid of? So when once it is ready, how to procure the quality seeds, the seeds which are in good condition? So the most important step in silkworm rearing is procurement of quality seeds free from diseases. So they should not be have any diseases. They should be free from diseases. They should be obtained from grainages, which are centers for production of disease free seeds of pure and hybrid races. These centers purchase cocoons from the certified seed cotton cocoon producers. The cocoons are placed in well ventilated rooms with proper temperature, humidity, and also emergence of um, moth is allowed. The grainage rooms may be kept dark, light may be supplied you know, to bring uniform emergence. Emerging moths are sexed and are used for breeding purposes. So the females are made to lay the eggs on paper sheets or cardboard. Egg sheets are disinfected with formalin and then they are washed with water to remove the traces of formalin and are dried in shades. The eggs are then again transported in the form of egg sheet. So it is easy to transport loose eggs. Uh, uh, loose eggs and to loosen the eggs, what you should do, suppose if they are tightened or they are hard, the sheets are to, should be soaked in water. And the loose sick, uh, uh, eggs are washed in salt solution uh, uh, the salt solution uh, of about 1.06 specific gravity so to separate out unfertilized eggs and dead eggs floating on the surface. Then prior to the final washing, the eggs are again disinfected with formalin. They are dried, baked to the required standard and then they are packed in small boxes with muslin covers and then they are dispatched to the buyers. So this is how actually the Procurement of the quality seed. That is, before you go for rearing, okay, what type of seed you should uh, take, uh, get it to the rearing, the, uh, what do you say, the uh, thing. And you should know, you should have all these uh, uh, things in mind. So unless and until you have a thorough knowledge of all these things, you cannot, you cannot go. So the procurement of quality seeds actually is a major, uh, what do you say, important aspect, uh, which everyone, I mean, for into this particular field should have a basic knowledge or basic understanding. The next is the brushing. So the process of transferring the silk worm to rearing trays is called as brushing. So when once you have selected the silk worm seed, then the next is you have to bring them, transfer them to the rearing trays. So this is called as this phenomena, you call it as nothing but brushing. That is process of transferring the silk worm to the rearing trays is called as brushing. Suitable time for brushing is about 10 a.m. So early in the at about 10 a.m. you can do it. Except at the blue egg stage are kept in black boxes on the day prior to hatching. The next day they are exposed to diffused light so that the larvae hatch uniformly in response to the stimuli. About 90% hatching can be obtained in about one day. So in case the eggs uh, prepared on egg cards are, are prepared on egg cards and the cards the cards with the newly hatched worms are placed in the rearing trays or boxes and then tender marbly reeds are chopped into pieces. A chalk and they are sprinkled over the egg cards. Okay, so in case of loose eggs, a net with small holes is also spread over the box containing the hatched larvae and mulberry leaves are cut into small pieces. So worms start crawling over the leaves on the net and the net with the worms is transferred to the rearing tray. So that is how you have to do a work. So when once you collect the seeds from the market, then you have to transfer them to the rearing trays. That is what we call it as nothing but the brushing. So when once you transfer it to the rearing trays, you have to provide them with the mulberry leaves. So what type of eggs you are taking it and how to um, give them or feed them with eggs, whether you need to give them the full um, eggs or you have to chop them or cut them into small pieces. Okay, so this all should be taken care of. The next is preparation of feed bed and feeding. How to feed them? So after brushing, the bed is prepared by collecting the worms and the mulberry leaves together by using a feather. So after brushing, what you have to do? You have to prepare a bed by collecting the worms and the mulberry leaves together by using a feather. So the bed is spread uniformly using chopsticks. The first feeding is given after two hours of brushing. Then the feed bed is a layer of nothing but chopped leaves spread on a tray or over a large area. Then the first and the second insta larva, commonly known as chowky worms. So for chowky worms, paraffin paper sheet is spread on the rearing tray. Chopped mulberry leaves are sprinkled on the sheet and the hash larvae are brushed onto the leaves. Second paraffin paper sheet is also spread over the first bed. So in between these two, water is soaked. Water soaked foam rubber strips are placed to maintain the humidity. Then the fourth and fifth instances are again rare in wooden or bamboo trays for any of these three methods. That is shelf rearing, floor rearing, as well as the shoot rearing. So 
these these are the three methods where so in shelf rearing the rearing trays are arranged one above the other so this method provides enough space for the rearing uh, then in floor rearing you, know, you have to fix rearing sheets are constructed out of uh, which are constructed out of wooden or bamboo strips in two tiles of 1 meter apart these sheets are used for rearing then chopped leaves are given as feed so this method actually is economical than the first one, first one uh, than the first one that this method can be practiced so chopped leaves are used then this method is economical then short rearing again is the most economical of the three the rearing sheet is used in 1 meter wide and any length long is single and the larvae of offered uh, with fresh shoot or picks bearing the leaves so this method again can be practiced both outdoors as well as indoors so each age of the egg silk worms could be conveniently divided into seven stages first feeding stage sparse eating stage moderate eating stage active eating stage pre molting stage last feeding stage molting stage so based upon the easters what what is their age and all those things the feed is also divided so how much amount of feed they need to give so based on that they have you need to give them the feed so in the first feeding stage they take very little amount that is the reason why you cut into small pieces sparse eating stage where they eat very very fast so you require more amount of feed leaves the moderate is moderate then active eating stage again here they uh, they actively feed so here more, more, more amount of leaves are required then pre molting stage again less then last feeding stage again less than the molting stage so which time at which particular period they eat and what is the stage so if we have a thorough knowledge of all these things then we can divide them the silk worms based on their age into different feeding stages now next is bed cleaning so when once the feeding and everything is over now periodical removal of leftover leaves and worms excreta may be undertaken because whatever the feed we are giving in the form of mulberry leaves the waste will be there so leftover leaves will be there and also the worms will excrete so this has to be removed so it should be undertaken and and is referred to as bed cleaning so that bed cleaning is nothing but removal of the left leaf over leaves as well as the worms excreta so it is necessary for proper growth and proper hygiene so four methods are adopted for this that is conventional method husk method net method and combined husk and net method so when once this is over then spacing so provision of adequate space is of great importance for vigorous growth because they need fast the silkworm start growing they need more and more space so spacing also has to be done proper spacing also has to be done so as the worms grow in size the density in the rearing bed increases and conditions of overcrowding will be faced so that is the reason why it is necessary to double or triple the space by the time of mold from one to other instar stage while the result with the result that they move from the first to the third the rearing space increases eight fold so in the fourth instar it is necessary again to increase the space by two to three times and in the fifth instar again twice so thus the rearing space has to be gone increasing up to 100 fold from the time of brushing till the time of maturation then la last one is your mounting now coming to mounting what is mounting mounting is tra transferring the mature fifth instar larva to mountages is called as mounting so when the larvae are fully mature they become translucent their body will shrink and they stop feeding and they start searching for a suitable place to attach themselves for cocoon spinning and pupation so this method you call uh, this period you call it as nothing but mounting so they are picked up and they are put on mountages so the worms attach themselves to the spirals of these mountages and they start spinning the cocoon so by continuous movement of the head the silk fluid is released in minute quantity which hardens to form a large continuous filament then the silk worm at first lays the foundation for the cocoon structure by weaving a web providing the necessary foot hold for the larva to spin then owing to characteristic movements of that the silk filament is deposited in a series of short waves forming the figure of h now this way layers are built and added to form the compact cocoon shell so when once the compact cocoon shell is formed the shrinking larva will wrap itself detaches from the shell and becomes a pupa or chrysalis the pupa here is called as chrysalis so the spinning will be completed within 2 to 3 days uh, will be within 2 to 3 days in multi voltine varieties and about 3 to 4 days in uni as well as in bi voltine varieties so this is called as the mounting stage now next is the harvesting of cocoons so when once the cocoons are developed so here now we have seen how it is see egg from egg to larva so you have different stages of larva 
So at the fourth to fifth stage, uh, stage larva, you have to actually transfer them to the mount edges. So where they actually go to, this larva will become pupa. So before it becomes the pupa, it starts to actually uh, produce the cocoon. So the cocoon, when once the cocoon is developed, then the uh, uh, pupa actually will come out of that cocoon. So now post cocoon, uh, the harvesting of cocoon. So when once the cocoons are formed, how to harvest the cocoon? So the larva undergoes will metamorphosis inside the cocoon and becomes a pupa. So the when once four to fifth instar we all see, have seen now when once four to uh, fifth instar larva is uh, uh, actually present. Now this what it will try to do? It will try to prepare or form a cocoon. So when once the cocoon is formed, you have to take out those cocoons because the larva will undergo the metamorphosis inside these cocoons and it will become the pupa. So in the early days. The pupal skin will be very tender and it will rupture easily. But as days passes, early harvest may result in injury of pupa also and this may damage the silk thread. So later harvest has, has a risk of threads being broken by the emerging moth. So it is therefore crucial to harvest the cocoons at proper time. You should not do it too early and you should not do it too late also. So cocoons are harvested by hand. So if you harvest them by hand, you can easily take out the silk that is being produced, that is if you uh, pupa, you can easily take out. So after harvesting, the cocoons are sorted out. Then the good cocoons are cleaned by removing the silk wool and fecal matter and they are then marketed. So here, so how to actually go about with the cocoons, whether they are good cocoons or whether they are bad cocoons. So when once you know, so sometimes you, um, you, you will not get uh, the cocoons of good variety. So you have to identify it and then you have to try to actually uh, pick all those good cocoons and then you have to uh, 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 market them. If the cocoons are not good, then you have to keep them aside and you should not uh, use it. So the gut coco good cocoons actually are cleaned by removing the silk and then the fecal matter and then they should be marketed. So these cocoons actually are sold by the farmers to phylature units through cooperative or the state government agencies. Now till here, it is the work of the farmers. Now, when once it is done, now the cocoons have to be actually marketed and it should be sent to the industry. So now these cocoons actually, uh, uh, till the formation of the cocoon, it is the farmer's job. Now it is the industrial job. So the farmers, what do they do? When once the cocoons are harvested, they sold it to the, uh, the markets, that is to the filiation units, through the cooperative or state government agencies. Then these cocoons are priced on the basis of the rendita and reeling parameters. So rendita may be defined as number of kg of cocoon producing one kg of rosin. So depending upon the you know, cocoon size and also depending upon whether they are healthier and good, the, uh, what do you say, the co uh, cost of the cocoons also will vary. So they say uh, uh, rendita and reeling means rendita is defined as number of kg of cocoon producing one kg of rosin. So the uh, number of kg of cocoons, how many kgs of cocoons will produce one kg based on that actually it is being sold. So when once it is done, then post cocoon processing. So what is a post cocoon? So when once the cocoons actually are being taken up by the industrial people, then they will undergo these all these processes to obtain the silk thread from the cocoon. So what are these various processes? So it is called as post cocoon processing. Now the post cocoon processing includes stifling, reeling. Now first one is stifling. Now stifling is the process of killing the pupa inside the cocoon is termed as stifling. Means you all know cocoons, what, what does the cocoon consist of? The cocoon consists of nothing but the pupa. So you need to actually kill the pupa to obtain the silk. So the process of killing pupa inside the cocoon. So when the pupa is inside the cocoon itself, you need to kill them. So the process of killing it called as nothing but stifling. So good size cocoons, about 8 to 10 days old, are selected for this processing. Stifling is done by subjecting the cocoon to hot water. You can expose them to hot water or steam, dry heat, sun exposure or cultivation. The next is reeling. The process of removing the threads from the killed cocoon is called as reeling. So now, then once the pupa is dead, now what do you need to do? You have to remove the threads. So the process of removing the thread from the killed cocoon is called as nothing but the reeling. So the cocoons are cooked first in hot water at about 95 to 97 for 10 to 15 minutes to soften the addition of the silk thread, then loosening the threads to separate freely and to facilitate the unbinding of the silk threads. So this process you call it as nothing but the cooking. So cooking enables the saracen protein to get softened and make unwinding easy without any breaks. So the cocoons are then reeled in hot water with the help of suitable machine 
four to five free ends of the threads of cocoons are passed through eyelets and guides to twist into one thread and then wound around a large V. The twisting is done with the help of croiser. The machine that is used actually is called as the croiser. So the silk is transferred finally to the spools and the silk is obtained on the spool with that, that the silk that, we obtain, that is being obtained is called as a raw silk called the yield silk. The raw silk is further again boiled, stretched and purified by the acid or by fermentation and is again washed to bring the luster. Raw silk or the real silk is finished in the form of skin and book for trading. So the waste outer layer or the da damaged cocoons and the threads that are being separated, they are teased and then filaments are spun. So this is called as the spun silk. So this is how actually the, uh, what do you say, the uh, reeling is uh, done. Now, uh, now coming to, this is all about the mulberry silk that we have seen. Now coming to the tasser silkworm. Now tasser silkworm, then we need to go for the tasser culture. So again, tasser silkworm, like the mulberry silkworm, you all know several species of anthrae are exploited for the production of this uh, wild silkworm known as tasser silk. Now it, it is actually being produced by Anthria mylita, Anthria pernia, Anthria mma, and Anthria uh, paphia and Anthria. Sorry. Anthria uh, royale. So these are reared in central and northern eastern parts of India. Uh, they are known by different names. Uh, these three types of volatilism, again, univoltine, bivoltine, and multivoltine are found in this, as we have seen in the, uh, what do you say, mulberry silk. Now, uh, uh, the these particular uh, tassa silkworms, uh, they are reared on trees of Terminalia uh, asan, which is called as ter uh, Terminalia tomentosa and Terminalia arjuna, that is arjun. So they don't feed on mulberry leaves, but these actually feed on the trees of Terminalia, that is tomentosa, which is called as asan, and Terminalia arjuna, that is called as arjun, and also Shoria robusta and Zizifus jujuba. Rearing of this has been introduced recently in Manipur. So they are also reared. Uh, they also are reared on Percus oak tree. Then um, uh, 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 this uh, Pernia species and MMA species are the tassel silkworms of China and Japan. These species are uh, uh, feed on Quercus or oak trees and they are normally bivoltine. So they are, these tassel moths are fairly large insects when compared to that of mulberry silk. The females are larger and yellowish while males are smaller and gray. Both have prominent and colorful eye spots. The rearing of the silkworm. Again, cultivation of the Food plants need to be done as we have seen for the mulberry. Same way here also, you have to actually first, before you go for the rearing of silkworm, you have to cultivate the food plant that is essential. So they are, the cultivation of the food plants, as the silkworms are wild in nature, they need to be reared outdoors. So modern sericulture is preferred to cultivate the food plants for better supervision. Cultivation is done with seeds or sapling being raised in nursery. Saplings are again translated, uh, planted. Agronic practice are carried out. Pruning is done regularly to maintain. Then it is a bivoltine variety of tester silk used for commercial. Then the cocoons are bivoltine. They are harvested in November to December, all those things. Okay. Then larvae hatch into 10 days, the hatching larvae. So likewise, same like mulberry silk uh, worm only. Again, they also undergo the four different uh, stages. That is the X, larva, pupa, and the adult. So a little bit of variation is there. But coming to this, only in the feeding habits uh, as well as in the um, uh, generation of uh, this uh, um, uh, silkworms. So again, same way, post cocoon processing is being done. That is the first cocoon. So it is always same way. So the spun silk here is called commonly called as the katya matka. Katya matka. So this is about the. I'm uh, going very fast because almost it is the same. Only thing here, the difference between the moga, uh, uh, sorry, mulberry as well as the tassa silk is the tassa silkworm actually uh, they are being uh, produced by anthria species. which belong to Saturnidae family. And here, they don't feed on the mulberry leaves, but here they feed on uh, the uh, Terminalia, Tormentosa, Terminalia, Arjuna. Apart from that, Shoria, Robusta, Zizifa, Zuzuba, and some of them also ray, uh, and, uh, feed on the Quercus as well as on the oak trees. Okay. Next is the Muga culture. Again, Muga silkworm. So Muga is an Asmis word, which indicates a golden brown, amber color of the cocoon. So that is why it is called Muga. So here again, it also comes under this Anthria uh, Asama. Again, it is mainly confined to Brahmaputra. So it also becomes uh, comes under Saturnidae family only. So its distribution in the is uh, in the wild state, uh, however, extends from Western Himalaya to Nagaland, such a district of Assam and Tripura. 
So commercial export is estimated only to this northern East India only. So again, this Muga silkworm is multivoltine, and it passes again through four moths, four insta stages, and generally produces four to five crops. And Muga silkworm is a polyphagous insect. So here it feeds on Machilus bombicine, and that is called Som and Listia poly. Polyanthia, that is saulu. These are the two principal host food plants for the Muga silkworm. Then, like other Lepidopterans, again it is a holometabolous insect. Again, it passes through again four different stages: like egg, larva, pupa, and the adult. The entire life cycle will last about forty-five for fifty days in summer and one hundred twenty days in winter. So this is again rearing of Muga silkworm. So like the seed cocoons extended same way. We have to done. Uh, there is nothing new. Only thing is again the variation. I told you, you know, it, it depends to different uh, family and also the uh, feed is different. Then uh, post cocoon harvesting, same way, stiffing, degumming, reeling, and all those things. And here almost entire reeling is done with a primitive machine called as the beer. Then you have eri culture. So eri culture is rearing of the eri silkworm. So this is silk is being produced by Philos Philosamia ricini, which is called as eri silk. So distribution it is again confined to Assam. And bordering districts, uh, bordering uh, districts of West Bengal, it is again multivoltine, and it is raised in those five to six times a year. Optimum conditions are this: male is smaller than female, and uh, female, both male and female, are chocolate black, uh, black or green colored wings. They are polyphagous again, uh, having the secondary food plants again. So primary food plants are Ricinus communis, that is castor, Heteropterus fragrans, that is caseru. Castor plants are again of two varieties. So they feed on this. They also feed on money hot, utilisima, that is tapioca, evodia, flexilima, then plumeri. Sorry. Ericulture. We are talking about ericulture. So this is called as eri silk. So the again the rearing of the eri silkworm is again the same. This uh, disease-free seed cocoons are again obtained from drainages and then they are reared the same way as we have seen for the uh, mulberry silkworm. Then post cocoon processing and all those things. Now coming to the diseases and pest of silkworms. So you all know since the silkworm, uh, what do you say, the production or the Production of the silk involves a lot of processes, uh, so definitely these silkworms undergo or yeah, they come across so many diseases. So you need to take uh, take lot of precautions and see that whatever the silkworm that you are rearing during the rearing uh, rearing period or during the culturing or whatever it may be. So and also when you feed them with the different plants, even the plants also may have diseases. So these diseases should not be spread to the silkworms. So a lot of care has to be taken. To see that the silkworm doesn't get any diseases. So, what are the various diseases and the pests of the silkworms, and how to come across uh, with these diseases? So, the diseases, different diseases that you find of of the silkworm are the different. They belong to say different types. But first one is the febrine. The febrine also known as the pepper disease or corpuscular disease. Actually, this disease is caused by sporozoan, which is called as Nosema bombesis. So the main source of infection is food contaminated with the spores. So when you are feeding them, uh, them with the mulberry leaves or any type of leaf, the feed should not be contaminated with the spores. So the infection can be carried from one larva to the another by the spores contained in the uh, feces, or it may be liberated in other ways by the moths carrying infection. So these febrinoid eggs easily get detached from the egg carts. Egg carts. So you have to take care. The next is. Flatchery. Flatchery again is a common term to denote bacterial and viral disease. So it is being caused here. This is caused by febrine disease. It's caused by sporozoan. Whereas this flatchery is actually a disease which is being caused. Uh, flatchery is a disease which is being caused by both bacteria as well as viral. So together they denote a term which is called as the flatchery. Now it has been classified again into different types. First one is the bacterial disease of digestive organs. Now, due to the poor supply quality of mulberry leaves, the digestive physiology of silkworm may be disturbed, and multiplication of bacteria may occur in the gastric cavity. So, different bacteria like Streptococci, E. coli, they will be find associated with the disease symptoms like diarrhea, vomiting, shrinkage. Next is septicemia. 
penetration and multiplication of certain kinds of bacteria in the hemolymph also will cause septicemia. So the principal pathogenic bacteria which, are, which causes septicemia include bacilli, streptococci and staphylococci. Again, some symptoms are diarrhea, vomiting, shrinkage of, of, of larval body. The next is the Soto disease. Soto disease is caused by the toxin of bacillus thuringiensis. So the larvae will become unconscious. Then you have infectious flattery. Again, which is caused by a virus called as Moratar virus. It does not form polyhedra, but the infection will occur mainly through the oral cavity, where the virus will multiply in the gut and is released into the gastric juice and is secreted, excreted in the feces. Then you have cytoplasmic polyhedrosis, which is again being caused by the virus called smithia, which form polyhedra. Then you have gasseria, which is also known as jaundice or nuclear polyhedrosis. It is again caused by a virus called as borrelinia. Then you have mus muscardine or carcinoma, which is again of two types, white muscardine, green muscardine, and yellow muscardine. So these are all again about different types. Now coming to the pest. So even some of the pests also will cause the disease. Those include Trichalga bombicus, a diphtherian fly, then Dermesti beetles, mites, uh, mites. So these are the three. Now, coming to the last one, that is the silk and its use. So now we have seen what are the various diseases which are being caused to the silk moth by bacteria, viruses, protozoans, as well as the different pests. Pests actually are seen on the mulberry leaves. So even they are um, uh, less sorry, harmful, and they cause the diseases to the uh, uh, silk moths. So we all know, actually, the silk is being produced through the silk moth. So this silk is very, very essential. It has got a lot of properties, and it is, um, it, it is being used in the fabrication industry. So what are the various properties of silk? Now, you all know, actually, it contains about 70 to 75 percent of fibroin and 25 to 30 percent of sericin protein. So the biochemical co composition of this fibrin can be represented. So it has the characteristic effect of pure silk with pure luster. It is insoluble in water, ether, or alcohol, but it dissolves in alkaline solution, mineral acids, and glacial acetic acid. And sericin, a gummy covering of the fiber, is a gelatinous body which dissolves very readily, which on cooling will form a jelly-like. Then it is precipitated as a white powder from the solutions by alcohol. Its chemical formula is given, so it can be dyed or before or after it has been woven into a cloth. So weight in gram of 900 meter long silk filament is called as a denier, which represents the size of the silk filament. So the silk has following peculiar properties. It has a natural color of mulberry silk. The natural color of mulberry silk is white, yellow or yellowish green. Tassar is brown, uh, um, um, brown. So that of tassar is brown, of muga it is light brown or golden, and here it is brick red of creamy white or light brown in color. So these are the natural colors. Mulberry silk usually is white, yellow, or yellowish green. Tassar silk is brown. Moga is light brown or golden. And here is brick red or creamy white or light brown. Silk has all the desirable qualities of a textile fibers. It has got strength, elasticity, softness, coolness, and affinity to dyes. That means it can take up any dye. And you can give any color to the silk. And the silk fiber has strong is strong having a breaking strength and silk fiber can elongate up to 20 percent of the original length and density is 1.3 to 1.37 grams natural silk is hygroscopic and it gains moisture up to 11 percent it is a poor conductor of heat and electricity however under friction it will produce static electricity then silk fiber can be heated to higher temperature on burning it produces a deadly hydrocyanic gas uses are, are you all know it is man used in the manufacture of several articles like garments in various places like plain, crepe, georgette, and velvet. Then you can also knit uh, knitted goods such as vest, gloves, socks, and stockings. Silk is dyed and printed to prepare ornamental fabrics for saris, ghagras, lehengas, dupatas, jackets, shawls, wrappers. You can use them in caps, handkerchiefs, scarves, dhotis, quids, bed covers, cushions. And also you can prepare them, uh, use them in making parachutes and parachute cords, fishing lines, sea for floor mills, insulation coil for electric and telephone wire, tires of racing, car, uh, racing cars, artillery gun, artillery gun powder, as well as for the surgical suits. So these are the various uses of the SIM.
so with this today we have finished our next class we will meet again and go with another chapter